India Unlimited is very happy to present this seminar, which will be really exciting. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the moderator for today, Mr. Mikolai Norek, who is the Managing Director for the Forum of Innovation Management. And I think you can tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Mikolai Norik. I, I run an organization that is called Forum for Innovation Management. We are owned and run and financed by the Carl Adam Bonnier Foundation. What the Bonnier fa this part of the Bonnier family wants us to do is look into opportunities within Sweden and primarily beyond Sweden for improving the Swedish innovation environment. Um, and be very critical on what very often is perceived as one of the top three, top five, top two, whatever, whatever index you look at, um, innovation hubs in the world. As you all know, statistics and indexes are always to be challenged because that's just how, the way it has to be. I think what we, I will just in a second um, have to honor to introduce our two speak shortly introduce our two speakers and then also lead you if you need any guidance and if you need any leadership on uh, in, in the panel. I think what we've seen these, but just let me reflect a minute for what I think what we are here for today. For this part of the world, I think these couple of weeks, months that are behind us and the ones that are in front of us will definitely, I think there is no, no, no doubt about that anymore. They will define the future of this generation and the future of our children's generation in many ways. We are maybe in the first, first for many, many decades in a situation of highly political insecurity within this country and within the entire European club, I would say. And then I just, I don't only mean the European Union. At the same time, I think what is very often common in, in, in times like that is that there's panic happening, in, in panic in, in political spheres and, and the idea of, of trying to find solutions quickly and find, trying to find solutions for very, very complex problems in easy ways out. And that's, I think, what we see in, in political spheres around the, around the globe and especially on, also here. The topic of innovation is one that is never connected to quick fixes. I think we all know that. And the topic of innovation and cherishing and growing innovative, an innovative future is never going to be easy or an easy way out or a quick, quick solution. There, there is no, it's just too complex. These last, so there is, a, there is a hope that we could get away and step aside from this panic and focus on what this place might be really good at, analyzing and acting upon a good part of analysis. And innovation could be one of the solutions. I think that I will try to have uh, f uh, work with this also in the panel. Uh, this week has seen INSEAD's new Global Innovation Index with a special chapter in India. Not many countries in the world receive a special chapter in that. There is, there is one in this. I will try to put some of these ideas in, into our, our discussion. I will also try to emphasize that what I like, oh, can we just jump back for a second? Into this first slide. I don't, I don't know if, if, you, if you will. A year ago, We've been talking, if we still do, we talk make in India. So I very much appreciate, and I think this is exactly the shift that we need to have in any of our discussions. Now it's making and innovating in India. And I, I realize that this is maybe the Swedish or the, your influence, Madam Ambassador, and this is maybe the government, partly. But I think this, you know, moving up, to me this is a moving up the value chain. Making or make still implies production. Make still implies a very important part in the, in the value chain, but one that doesn't make me too comfortable, I have to admit. This makes me very comfortable, and this is exactly where India should be, should be and is. So I really like this development, just over a year. Having said all that, Madam Ambassador, could I ask you 
for a couple of words of introduction also from your from your end. <gasps> well, he's he's actually stolen uh, much of what I was going to say. But dear guests, uh, we were here, and some of you were here as well. Um, a few days ago when we had the previous seminar to <clears throat> talk about the Make in India Week, which is happening in Mumbai in just, just uh, over a week's time. And um, as you would have uh, perhaps noted, uh, because one of your uh, newspapers did carry it, I'd said at the end of it that the, there will be a high-level delegation from Sweden. I'm very happy to have the freedom to tell you that, in fact, the Swedish Prime Minister is himself leading a very, very big business and uh, government agency, the Team Sweden delegation to uh, India for the Make in India Week. Uh, but Sweden is not the only country from where a prime minister is coming. We also have the prime ministers of uh, Finland and Lithuania, as far as I know. Now, why is this importance, you know, why is this interest in such a high level in India from these countries, but I'd particularly focus on Finland and Sweden, Nordic region in general. This is something that is really inspiring for us because one thing you were wrong in, Mikulai, is that Make in India is the government's plan, but it also includes innovating with, in, and for India. And that is where I think today's event fits in very well because the making and innovating in India, cycle of change and innovation, that is the way we have to go. And the relationship between India and Sweden, it gets its energy from the fact that it is based on very strong complementarity in the area of innovation. For me, innovation is not just sitting in a lab and coming up with things. Innovation is social innovation. Innovation is looking at something and finding a different use for it, or looking at the conditions and adapting to it. Now, in Sweden, because you don't really have much of an issue about cost financing, it's a higher cost country, <coughs> you have a number of innovations, but which are perhaps not very cost effective if you look at the Indian market. But Indian market or the Asian market is the larger market that innovations will have to look at to become viable. So you have a complementarity of the market size, you have a complementarity of the need, the needs that India has and the strengths that Sweden has. This is what creates the future. And making in India is not just you know, shifting your low-cost manufacturing to India as has happened with an, another Asian country I will not name a few decades ago. With India, it'll have to be a different approach. It's not, we won't be cost-effective anymore for making T-shirts, but we will be cost-effective for innovating with you, and I really welcome the trend of Swedish companies which are setting up their R&D centers in India, American companies were ahead of them in this, but I'm very happy to see that Swedish companies have also begun to set up R&D centers in India because arguably the single best rich, riches, uh, what is it, single best resource of India is its people, the quality of its people. And I cannot end without a little bit, once again, bragging of our space program because you can think about you know, cheap innovation, as they say, for something which is just going to take you from here to Drottinggatan, but not for something which is going to take you from here to the moon, so, or here to the Mars, as a matter, matter of fact. And to be able to do that at one-tenth of the cost did not just need a cheap adjustment, it needed real innovation. And we want to tell the story of the success of India and Sweden collaboration in innovation because it's not a one-way story. It is a two-way story. We gain and you gain. And I'm confident that at the end of this seminar, that is the lesson that you will take. And spread, please, in the, your circles because 
after three and a half years, I still feel sometimes disappointed that of the huge spectrum of India, so many people in Sweden still seem to think of only the, you know, about one hundredth of the part of that spectrum that they have heard about. But you who are here today, especially in the business sector, who have been to India, who have collaborated with Indian companies, with Indians, you know that the reality is much more than that, and it is a much more hopeful, much more dynamic, much more energetic. So help us spread that message and do whatever you can to increase the collaboration between India and Sweden in every way, but particularly in the field of innovation. And today's success story, I think, will be an inspiring one. Thank you. What is the bitter pill of policy? for policymakers, for prime ministers around the world. It's never countries with countries who make business. It's people with people. So this, what we have in, in front of us now, the next 30 or 35 minutes or so, is exactly, exactly that. Two individuals representing two companies, two countries, who started to work with each other, to, to start to collaborate. And I'd love to start with uh, Dr. Floria, the CEO of Nagoro, um, to explain to us your way into this collaboration, and then we will continue with the Asablo uh, side of it, where, where both parts will focus on what did we learn from each other and where is this relation, where is this relation building really happening? And then we'll have a panel. Thank you so much. I'm going to talk about our uh, cycle of change and innovation with Sweden. And uh, uh, as Madam Ambassador said, uh, India is really changing very fast. I've lived uh, half my life in the US and Europe and the Middle East. And I think the time that India is going through is really historical. Uh, it's not just the innovation in the space program. Uh, the real uh, excitement comes from the fact that I, I just met recently a small private team of individuals who wants to land a, a lander on the moon. They're competing for the worldwide uh, Google or NASA, I forget now, prize. Uh, after two or three years of development, they're in the last 10, in the first 10, they got, uh, I think, a million dollars from, one of the, from Google or NASA, again, I forget. But just a team of young kids, and they want to land something on the moon. Yeah? So it's that which is really uh, stirring today. Uh, but you know, we are a technology company as Nagaro, and we work with a lot of clients in a lot of different areas, different industries, different technologies, different countries. And technology for us and innovation around technology is, is passe. You know, we do it every day. Yeah? So I will not spend much time talking about it. I will instead spend time talking about what we have learned about Sweden uh, and what we have learned from Sweden in matters of the heart, so to speak. Yeah? So. Uh, technology, I think, uh, globally today, technology is not very much separating technologists in the US from technologists in Germany, from technologists in Sri Lanka or wherever. But there is a lot that we can learn from each other, even beyond technology, and innovation doesn't end at technology alone. So in the area of uh, organizational design, in the area of ecological uh, thinking, in the area of social thinking, I think there's a lot that we, we can learn from each other. So, you know, we, some, some uh, months ago, we uh, defined our core values which are, which, uh, of the company, which are listed there. Uh, and you will find that these are rather Swedish in their nature. And I think the character of our company has, has uh, uh, been uh, infused with our learning from, from uh, our Swedish colleagues, Asa Abloy, but also we have uh, other, a couple of other people from other companies we have worked with in Sweden. We uh, first found Sweden about a decade ago, and we started working with Net Entertainment uh, first. Um, and we found a very different culture from different countries we were uh, working with. I mean, just to give you uh, the context, we work with about, uh, we are present in about 10 countries, and we work with different companies from all over the world. But Net Entertainment had a style of organization and a style of uh, uh, fun and their offices had a certain atmosphere that was really special. And, uh, you know, as, we, uh, you know, uh, Net Entertainment is a gaming company, so of course you can imagine that it's slightly more fun than uh, uh, other more traditional industries. 
But as we went to other even more serious uh, quote unquote uh, industries, we found a different style of working. And I think uh, we really, it really resonated with us. Uh, the certain aspects of it, certain philosophies, which I later came to know were part of the Swedish uh, mindset, the Swedish uh, philosophy and psychology uh, really resonated with us. So, you know, we, we try to copy ourselves uh, on this, uh, we try to copy this and, and, and base our, our organizational design. At that time, you know, 10 years ago, we were about one seventh the size of what we are today or one eighth or, or, or even more, even smaller. Uh, so, but as we grew, we were very keen that we don't set up a huge factory type model of working. We, we wanted to be, we really believe that what Sweden as a small country and uh, uh, companies like Net Entertainment are doing, even as small players, they are leading the world. Uh, there's something to be learned from that. And uh, as uh, you know, we talk more about innovation, as we talk more about uh, uh, user experience, as we talk more about people-to-people uh, -people connect, uh, I think these are very important uh, uh, aspects to embed in, a, in the development of a, of a company, for example. So we really try to you know, buck the general perception of IT services, uh, try to build a more agile, emancipated uh, model where the individual is celebrated and the, the, the hierarchy is non-existent. We, we, don't, we don't have an org chart in our company. We don't have even an org chart. We try to take it even a little bit further than maybe your companies take it. So you know, it's, it's just splashed on there. And maybe, yes, we do have, you know, of course, some structure. And, uh, but this leads to some interesting uh, conversations. Uh, for example, at the Austrian Railway, we were bidding for a, uh, for a project which we won. Uh, but they asked for an org chart because that was required as part of the RFP. And we said, we don't do org charts. Uh, this is all we have, you know, and we're, it's just all, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, but this is really important for us. We don't believe in the top-down uh, uh, approach. Uh, we believe that value is added at the leaves of the tree, uh, not in the, in, in, not in the trunk, uh, and uh, so this is, it's really influenced our thinking. Yeah? But, but even more than organizational design, which I really, we owe a debt to, to our, our, the friends we made in Sweden, uh, I think uh, we have been really impressed by the ecological thinking uh, of, uh, uh, of Sweden. And it's uh, about how you protect your green spaces and how you protect your environment and how, uh, how much, uh, even in today's day and age, you still find it important to be uh, emotionally connected to uh, these vast open spaces. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, other countries also have vast open spaces, but they are seen as places you drive by, yeah? to go from one place to another place. And here it's very different. And this, uh, and this extends even to the cities. And uh, 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 in, in uh, poorer countries like India and China, where cycles were the way of main mode of uh, transport, they are now seen as the thing where you know which only poor people ride. And it's it's refreshing to see uh, 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 this uh, uh, accent on walking and cycling and public transport, even in in cities that can afford to have cars. Uh, India has somehow been influenced a lot by the U.S. system of uh, consumption. Um, you know where uh, the only walk you ever take is from the parking lot to the mall, uh, and uh, uh, you have these you know multi-layered overpasses and uh, flyovers, and uh, and it's not sustainable uh, for a country like India. You know we are uh, 20 million people in Delhi alone, and uh, if we each bought a car, we would not have place to park it. Uh, uh, the city would be just full of cars. So. Uh, uh, our company, as, a, as one of the initiatives that we took, we really got involved in uh, urban uh, uh, transport planning, and we sort of made it one of our key issues, our key themes. Uh, uh, you know, we, we were really scared about the air. I mean, this is the view from my window on two, uh, apartment window on two different days, and uh, the air in Delhi is uh, one of the worst in the world, and in China is very bad as well. Uh, uh, and this, these have, this has consequences both locally and globally. And uh, you know, today, uh, whatever we can do to solve these, this issue is uh, uh, is a real lifesaver for all of us. So it was a it was a uh, immediate problem. It was a potent problem. And for the last couple of years, we at Nagaro have been really tackling it. And I, I'm very happy to report that we have had a lot of uh, prog made a lot of progress around it. 
So the first thing we did was, this is a little bit funky, we got a pop group to uh, write a song, uh, make a music video, people leaving their cars and taking the train and taking the bus and taking the, uh, and cycling and uh, walking. And uh, you know, all these cars belong to our company folks and their company folks in the pictures. And uh, so there's a proper full music video. It was a really uh, uh, fun exercise even to uh, have this video, uh, to make this. Uh, we began promoting cycling. So all our buildings now have uh, cycle stations. You can pick a cycle and you can cycle to the another building. You can take it home. You can take it over the weekend. And this is, uh, you know, it seems like a small thing in this city, but it's a, it, was a, it was a really strong statement to make. And I think, uh, at least in North India, I think there were a couple in Hyderabad, but it was the first cycle stations uh, uh, you know, in, in the country. Uh, we... Uh, really made it uh, more and more, uh, uh, we tried to put an accent on the fact that, you know, cycling is not just for people who can't afford cars. And, you know, we were, every time I would, I would come to Stockholm, I would take a few photographs and put it on Facebook and, and put it on, on Yammer, our internal social network, and trying to build this, uh, mind, this change of mind and heart. And, and today, you know, I'm, it, it, it's just not about, you know, uh, we were talking about it earlier, a couple of us here. It's not just about greening your buildings. I think you have to change the way people think about the environment around us. And I think we did a good job of, of that over you know, spending some money, but also uh, a lot of effort to try to bring, bring people to uh, change their thinking. Uh, one of the most exciting things we did in retrospect uh, uh, was the Rahagiri Day. So Rahagiri is a, uh, is a Hindi word, it means the way of the road, you know, so it's like a little pun on a few other Indian Hindi words. But the idea was that on Sundays we would shut a part of uh, Gurgaon, which is a suburb of uh, uh, Delhi, like uh, Chista is a suburb of Stockholm, we st uh, shut a part of the roads to traffic for a, a few hours, uh, five to six hours. <clears throat> and we started this about a couple of years ago. And this, uh, we got permission from the authorities to do this. This became like a movement. Uh, typically on every Sunday, there are thousands of people uh, walking around, uh, maybe playing soccer, maybe uh, playing some music, uh, maybe cycling, maybe some, uh, uh, some uh, yoga, some uh, Zumba or whatever. Uh, this, this became very popular in Gurgaon. And since then, it's now spread to 15 or more cities. I, I don't know how many because every few weeks, a new city launches it. So I just feel very proud that every uh, weekend on, on Sunday, maybe 100,000 people are experiencing the road outside their cars. And of course, this is important for uh, poor people as well because they don't, there's not enough place to play maybe and they get some chance to you know, walk around and... and but it's also a place for way for rich people to realize that walking on the road is also possible. Uh, you, you don't just have to drive to everywhere you need to get to. And I think in some ways, uh, it's also a way for uh, the administration to connect with people. So uh, the administration, the, the, the mayor, the police, uh, whoever is involved are quite relatively quite involved in these, uh, in these activities. And it's a way for people to see each other as people and not just as the rulers and the ruled. Uh, so the, the government to people interaction has really benefited. On uh, the 22nd of December, September last year, we had the World Car Free Day. And uh, again, uh, trying to be aggressive, we decided we would uh, not bring any cars to work that day. And since we have 3,000 people, roughly, uh, we took about 1,000 cars off the road and just ran 50 buses. Uh, because there, there isn't a bus service, uh, uh, adequate bus service. So we ran about 50 buses. And this really uh, became uh, national news, uh, that a significant company had uh, taken such a big step. And then uh, we uh, decided, uh, and we got a lot of support from our city police, I must say, they really, uh, uh, the commissioner of police, etc., really uh, uh, batted with us, and they gave us the helped us get the media coverage, etc., so that we were really being able to make a difference in perceptions. Uh, every Tuesday, then in Gurgaon, we began to hold a car-free day. It's not fully car-free, but for example, we have a parking charge at our offices. We have so people tend to try to take another way, mode of transport to work. And we have a little cycle rides and stuff like that. Uh, Delhi then, so Gurgaon is relatively small compared to Delhi, but this spread to Delhi. 
and Delhi, which was coming to grips with the problem of pollution, uh, noticed this. And the chief minister uh, decided that every month, they did not do it every week, every month they would hold a car-free day. And uh, uh, their car-free day, which is held at different parts of the city, it created a new awareness, and a new awareness of uh, the ecological impact uh, and unsustainability of the car. Yeah. And, you know, our our folks were again involved in the design, etc., of the Car Free Day. So we've been very, very close to that. And Delhi has gone to take some more severe steps. In January, I don't know if you have, all of you have heard of it, but for a couple of weeks, odd number cars were not allowed on even number days, and even numbered cars were not allowed on odd number days. So took half the cars of the road, uh, or if not half, 25% of the cars of the road, because commercial vehicles were exempt. But this mindset change, you know, uh, propagated uh, all the way through the, to the uh, the leadership of Delhi. Yeah. And uh, some months ago, in fact, the embassy of uh, India in Sweden was uh, hosting the Delhi uh, 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 delegation from Delhi to Stockholm to try to understand, uh, you know, how Stockholm views its urban planning, etc. So, you know, uh, uh, this uh, uh, coincidental relationship. Uh, also found a uh, uh, more formal uh, connection and, and voice. And this is now really a national topic, and uh, uh, the country is coming to grips with it. And I, I dare say that, uh, you know, people say that being a democracy, India is uh, slow to change and China is faster. Uh, 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 I would say that being a democracy and having a strong uh, uh, media, uh, uh, it has its strengths, and I, I would dare say that we would we will solve this problem before uh, China ends up solving this problem. I think we have we are, we are seized of it. Awareness is very very high. Uh, you won't believe it, but uh, national polls or polls uh, for of, of Delhi residents uh, after the car free day uh, after the, after the odd even uh, rationing showed almost seventy percent of online newspaper readers, which are typically the more affluent, who do drive cars in favor of the rationing, uh, which is uh, really, really surprising. Uh, you know, you tend to think that uh, technology travels uh, eastward from the west, and uh, uh, things like uh, social and uh, philosophical stuff travels from the east to the west. It's not always so. So uh, we, we actually, uh, we feel very, very uh, confident about ourselves uh, te technologically, um, uh, but we also feel that we have, a, we have a lot to learn also from other countries and the ways they, they run their, their cities and their, their organizations. And so uh, this is the last slide of my talk. Uh, it's, it's like a cycle of change and innovation. Ten years ago, we were approached by the Invest in Sweden agency and asked to take a look at Sweden. And uh, today I'm asking uh, you guys to take a look at India. I think. Uh, uh, I must say that you know I've, been, I've lived in the valley uh, for several years in California. I've lived uh, all over the world. The mood in in India in the last six to twelve months is uh, like the mood in uh, uh, Silicon Valley in ninety three and ninety four. It's it's on fire. There are fifty startup incubators in Delhi alone. Incubators. There are thousands of startups. And of course, some of these are, people are very uh, naive, and some of them are very, very interesting and impressive. And it's not just startups about creating the next uh, uh, e-commerce platform to sell, uh, you know, uh, customized T-shirts or whatever. It's actually biomedical devices, uh, 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 all kinds of sensors, all kinds of you know, Wi-Fi switches, and and these are just kids. Uh, some of them college dropouts. Some of them just done finish their college. Uh, it's it's a completely new country that's emerging, and and the national leadership is actually pushing that with a startup, uh, uh, you know, big startup uh, uh, impetus. So I think that uh, if we meet here five years from now, uh, we'll have seen a huge change. I mean, we've already seen the billion dollar investments in e-commerce companies in India. Several of them raised a billion dollars each last year. But that is one one sort of thing. That's more of a copy uh, mechanism where American models or Chinese models are being copied. But a new set of, I know a guy who's who's barely 30 years old, 
And with $100,000, he did the uh, chemistry, uh, the thin films, the uh, laser, the uh, lenses and optics, the electronics, the plastics, and built a handheld uh, hemoglobin measurement device for $100,000. I mean, come on. I mean, this is amazing stuff. This is, and, and he wants to now do the entire set of uh, 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 blood tests, and he's just going after them six at a time. He raised two or three million now. And uh, he, he, he's, he's a Steve Jobs. Yeah? Uh, he's not less than Steve Jobs. Uh, so you have, you have these amazing, amazing people. Uh, so anyway, uh, I could go on and on, but uh, I just wanted to give you uh, a quick uh, summary of a few years. And, and thanks for, for to all of you uh, in Sweden and in Stockholm for being part of this journey with us. Thank you. All right, let's see. So yes, I'm Ingmar Berg, and I'm a product innovation manager uh, at Asabloy uh, here in, in Stockholm. Uh, but I'm responsible for our um, R&D office, a new R&D office that we are doing together with Nagaro in uh, Gugan in India. So I've been asked to give a short presentation on that story. First of all, maybe a few words on Asabloy. Asabloy. Actually, we are the, the global leader in uh, providing safe door solutions globally, worldwide. And uh, we have our own operations in over 70 countries. And uh, we have a global co coverage uh, using distributors in, in the rest, I would say. And we are a very big country, very big company, 44,000 employees and um, about 57 billion in sales over year. Thought it could be interesting to just show you this this historical timeline as well. So um, we actually just made 20 years, uh, 2014, and it has been a pretty pretty interesting uh, uh, journey. This this uh, this 20 years, starting off with uh, merging Assa and Abloy to Nordic regional companies, very regional. Uh, what I would say, traditional luck companies into Asabloy, and then a long story of uh, of growth, both both uh, on uh, locally, but also by doing a lot of uh, acquisitions. I think over 200, 200 ac acquisitions over these 20 years. So, what are the growth drivers for the, the, the largest lock company in, in the world? Um, well, of course, the electronic world, all the demands on electromechanical solutions that, that uh, are, are required for this new world. And that, that includes access control solutions and the security, secure identity solutions and uh, automatic doors. I think that uh, another driver is, is our um, uh, geographical uh, and uh, expansion. So we are expanding into different new areas. And I think that uh, that's, that's something that lies a lot ahead of us. And of course, in the world, as you, oops, as, uh, as you explained in the beginning, we are in a world of increased need for security. So I think that fits as well. And of course, high expectations on that security when it delivers on, on security, but also on, for instance, usability. How, can, how usable our solutions are. We're also continuing our acquisitions and working, working a lot with our branding strategy to bring local brands into our global Asabloy brand. But last, but definitely not least, innovation. I think that innovation is a, a key driver for us. How to find innovat innovative solutions to secure our future. And then uh, also just, just another slide on, on our organization. We are organized in, uh, in uh, three geographical areas, Americas, 
the Europe and the EMEA and the Asia Pacific. And then we have two different product divisions. The global technologies that includes HID, that provides identity solutions, and hospitality, that is a, is a market leader on solutions for, for hotels and cruise ships. And uh, then we have the entrance systems. So, Share Technologies, that's the organization that I am part of. And just to explain, yeah, we have some organizational charts here. <laughs> so just to explain where we, where we are in, in the organization, really. So this is a small, pretty small organization, about uh, uh, staff about 200 that uh, sits close to our CTO of Södergren. And the purpose is to provide uh, provide common technology. How is, is the microphone? Is that working okay? Or, no? Common technology uh, platforms, electronic and software, and actually services to the different divisions for them to work on. We also have a, have a key responsibility in, in providing pre product innovation, so uh, in uh, key areas for the group. And as I said, we are reporting directly to the CTO. So, Shatek then. Uh, I'm working at the office here in Stockholm, where we have the main part of the development. And we have also had uh, an office in Spain, Cambrils, for, for many years. During the last three years, we expanded into Poland, Krakow, very nice city, where you can do a lot of bicycling, I would say. And uh, that has been... That has been uh, um, an ongoing journey for the last three years to expand into 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 uh, Poland, and then last year we took a decision to expand into Gugan and set up an office together with Nagaro to expand even further. And and our working mode is a global working mode. We we need a global cross-functional uh, teams working to find innovative solutions to our divisions. So that, this is the way that we, that uh, Astabloy is trying to meet the, the rapid transformation that actually is going on in the locking industry from the very traditional mechanical solution that is still a main part of our business actually, to uh, several electronic solutions that we have been providing during maybe yeah, the last 10, 15 years to what's going on today in different new ways of, um, of um, opening doors using new devices to whatever might be required in the next in 10 years. We don't know, but we're working hard to try to understand it. And in this environment, there is a requirement for a lot of innovation and teams working close with the market globally to understand what is required. So, to meet this challenge, we are focusing on a few key drivers. And one is agility. We think we are strong believers of agility to learn, always learn, try to, to, um, to test, to do prototypes, to iterate, to evolve the solutions that is important to us to, to make cost efficiency, but also to find the right solutions. Of course, uh, increased investment is needed to support this, to support and, and to support the global expansion and to be able to, to leverage on a global, global uh, uh, presence. And in this, in this situation, it's important for us to, to find partners, that, strategic partners that we can work and share va values with. So, some success, success factors then while developing the, this, uh, this product development organization. Again, agility, this is a key word for us, as well as lean, have lean processes to, to cut off as much of the waste as possible. 
same ways of working with partners. Here we come into something that I think is very interesting because the point that I'm trying to make here, depending on what you're trying to achieve, in this case we're trying to achieve global cross collaborating units and then we need to share some values and some ways of working. So we have been working hard to try to achieve a common ways of working between our teams, some kind of base, and we need to share that between all the different sites. Of course there are variations, but that's important to us. And that includes our partners. And of course, in this, in this, in this way of working, in this operational mode, we actually are staying away from, from the conventional outsourcing setups. And, of course, this doesn't happen just over a month or a few months. This require, will require some long-term long planning and long-term investment, and that's, that's the journey that we are on now. Yeah, this is just a, a short a illustration of actually what has been going on over the last few years. We have been working together with Nagaro for, for a few years, and um, but last year, when we took the decision to set up, set up the, the office, we have expanded uh, several times. And currently, we have a setup, I would say, with about 50 team members in, in Gugon working in this, in this mode of operation. But we also have other Asabloy as projects going on, in a, maybe in a more traditional setup at the same time. So, a few words on this journey then. So, um, some time ago we identified the need to strengthen our the shared tech organization. We need to invest more in innovation. And uh, we needed to find a cost efficient way to ramp up rather quickly. And that was when we identified the, the need for a new shared tech center. And we did a pre-study internally to try to evaluate different options. And for us, of course, innovation, that is what we are trying to do, agility, and the location in, in an emerging market was uh, were key, identified as key drivers, because we strongly believe in that we need to be present in our markets to try to understand what solutions, what products does the customer actually ask for, what, what is working in, this, in, the, in the environment. We did an RFI and RFP process and um, actually visited a, a few different uh, suppliers and Nangara was selected as a partner in this. And I think this was very much based on the, on the values and, and the proof of agility, not having, for instance, uh, your organization short, but a very strong belief in agility. And of course, pricing, that's always important. But also, of course, the previous experience, experience during a few years and also some references from other partners or other companies working together with Nagaro. So that was why we decided to go with Nagaro and actually set up a development office in January last year. And uh, this, this was the nice inauguration uh, ceremony together with uh, our CEO, Johan Molin. And, uh, I think we have a rather nice office in, in, uh, in Gugon. So, some key challenges. Now it becomes interesting. So, so how is this working? Well, as any multi-site, multi-geography setup, we have a lot of challenges. And I think it's, it's not, a lot of them are the same as if we would have a, a new office in Sefle or Jönköping or somewhere. It's, as long as you're not sitting just close to each other, we have a lot of problems, and those, I think, are the same. Uh, but another, another one that is interesting to, to point out is, of course, the ways of working that we are trying to, to, um, to achieve, that I think Manas was, was into describing, the, the open mindset, and, and um, you are actually allowed to try things out, you're allowed to fail. That is, that is not something that you just can say, do like that, and then it works. You need to, to show that it actually, it's true. You, you are allowed to fail. Okay, this is 
good try. Let's see how we can evaluate and, and find a better solution. This is something you need to work on continuously, every day, to make it happen. And also, agility in a cross-site setup. It's really, it puts some extra demand on, on, team, on the team and on organization. I think that you need to carefully look at to make sure that your teams are actually on the train, that they would like to take part in, in a, in a cross-site collaboration because, because it, it requires you to, be, to have a mindset that, well, you need to continuously have, want to try to make it work. You need to, want to put some effort into that. You can't just, yeah, you need to find, find people that are up for the, for the challenge, I, I would say. And then, of course, there are some communication issues, and those are really, really tough, I would say. We are looking a lot into tools to try to find the, the, the right supporting tools. We have in, invested a lot in like VCs, video conference equipment and stuff. But how do you really, how do you do a architectural collaborative design discussion cross-site? That's not that's not so easy. So that's actually things that we are working on right now to try to find better ways of making that happen. Because it has to happen. If it doesn't, then we will fail, actually. Because then we will have different teams that, that are not able to, to share their ideas cross-site. That's, so that's an, an enabler that we must uh, succeed in. Then building phase uh, time. Or actually, we do invest in some some travel, because we, we think to build the trust that is required for this to work, then we need to invest in people meeting each other for a few times, because that builds the trust that is required to, to really come into this mood of operation that is required in, a, in an agile team. So, a future vision, future vision then, well, as I think I said a few times, it's already, it's... The vision is to build a global collaborative teams that are working, covering all sides. So this goes for, for Krakow and, and Kambils and Stockholm as well. And we need to, we are, we're working on identifying what, what kind of glue is, is, um, is needed to, to make this to work. Maybe, for instance, a global architectural virtual team that you need to make some, identify some areas where you might need to build some virtual teams that are gluing this together so that we don't, in the end, end up with four different sites. And uh, because the target is that each site should be able to, to, to operate independently, but of course, cooperate in the project as we set them up. And for Gugon, we're currently the strategy currently is to build the domain knowledge. So that's an investment, and that's important. We need to, that's a challenge for Nagaro. We need to, to keep the staff, because we need to build domain knowledge. It takes time. And then evaluate and expand on opportunities as they come up. Yeah, my name is Hans Lundberg. I'm professor in environment technology. Retired right now, but active in India. Uh, uh, yes, I've been to Gorgon, and I've seen the rapid, rapid development of Delhi, actually. And uh, my uh, also taking part of the the, uh, the ministerial uh, delegation coming from Delhi, offering smart cities collaboration with Sweden. You didn't mention anything, uh, Mr. Nikai, in, in your first presentation here about the connection to smart cities, because this is one of the of the core, core issues for our. I was an inventor of the Symbio City of Sweden, the green cities of Sweden, and I felt the public participation, the green way of living, and all the social aspect, and of course cycling and so forth. How are you managing to approach Modi's 100 smart cities? Thank you. Uh, luckily, it's not my responsibility, uh, at least not my sole responsibility, except as a citizen. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, there, is a, there is indeed a gap between the uh, vision of the smart cities and the kind of funds and the kind of commitment and the kind of know-how and the kind of mindset that is required to set them in motion. Now, I can talk for a day about the kind of uh, 
practical obstacles we encounter for even a small change like introducing a bus service in Gurgaon, for example. Uh, but I think that even the discussion of these topics is, is a step. And, uh, uh, you know, Rome was not built in a day and these cities will not be built in a day. But I think the awareness, as I said, is very, very high. So uh, I can't really uh, address your question fully, but uh, I sympathize with your point of view. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Mr. Falori and Mr. Ingemar. I'm Sandeep. I'm from Coimbatore, from Tamil Nadu, and I'm doing my master's in product innovation, KTH. Um, personally, I wanted to ask this question because you have been involved with both India and Sweden at the same time. And my question is that, what is that one place where India lacks, where Sweden will complement? And what Sweden lacks, where India will complement? Uh, in my view, I think that the way the ways of working, how to approach uh, product innovation agi in an ag agile manner, I think that is something that where I think we. Well, my personal opinion is that we we, we have uh, something to bring and to, to share and, and to evolve together with our Indian colleagues. And um, the other way around, yes, I was. I think I was asked that question a bit earlier. I'm not sure. Of course, there are a lot of. There are a lot of things I like. Um, I like yoga, for instance. <laughs> but but uh, I think that, um, of course, as 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 uh, as a uh, market that is exploding, I think there's a lot, a lot to bring into, bring into Sweden on how to get on get on that train and to be part of the, the emerging world, and to be part of that, you need presence and you can bring that from 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 India into into our company, for instance. I think that's yeah, my view. So, so in the technology sector, you know, our technological uh, technical growth has been largely driven by the services industry. And that has certain characteristics which don't lend themselves to innovation. Uh, or maybe they do. But at the moment, they're not lending themselves to innovation. Uh, it's a very young workforce, average age in the 20s. Uh, it's a very domain. It's very horizontal. It's not really focused on domains. And uh, it's working with uh, clients who are really experts in their domains, uh, who are top experts, typically older. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that the, uh, and also I think it's cultural slightly. I think we are uh, a culture of uh, a lot of deference for seniority, a lot of uh, uh, very rel relatively modest and, and, and humble, uh, which has its strengths. But the negative is that there's less of a spark to innovate. But as I said, uh, 10 years later, this will not be the case. The India of today is unrecognizable from the India of the 80s or 90s. And the India of the 2020s will be unrecognizable from the India of today. I feel this is, uh, uh, and, and there's a lot that we are learning today. And in terms of, I think, uh, you know, uh, what we can, we, we maybe Sweden can learn or other European countries can learn. And Vikla, you were mentioning it earlier. I personally feel it. The individual hunger it really, you use the word hunger, and I completely agree. It's massive. Uh, I mean, if I talk to a, an audience of a, a hundred people at a business school and I ask them, "What do you want to be?" They will say, eighty of them will say, "Entrepreneur." Yeah. If you go talk, even in our company, and you know, I, I ask someone, you know, when some, I'm interviewing somebody for a job, I say, "Where do you want to be five years from now?" Odds are, they say, "I want to run my own company." Yeah. So it's a gutsy environment. It's a young environment. Uh, there are huge structural problems with education. You know, again, we, I can talk the whole day about about that. Our education is still in the socialist system, where it's tightly regulated, controlled, uh, and not set free. But you know, one day these things will be will be history. And uh, there is a lot of I think uh, uh, latent energy from a young, growing economy uh, in, in the country, and also, of course, as a market, uh, and also, uh, I, I think the world of the future will be uh, very. Uh, symbiotic and interesting. Uh. Thank, you, thank you very much for t to both of you. I would have one wish list on our Prime Minister's uh, list when he visits India, and very much related to this, to this topic. Maybe somebody from you can also reflect upon that. In it. Um, I don't know any country other than India that is so advanced in cross-religious tolerance, Tolerance from eth different, different ethnic backgrounds, tolerance on different languages. These things don't matter in, in India, but they matter so much in this place. 
So I, I, and I would sub, uh, sub, sub, summarize this under social innovation. So if there is something I want, yes, please, react. One, one, one comment on that. You know, unfortunately, you know, there are fringe elements in every society. And, you know, when uh, some people uh, at the Stockholm Central Station, they, they beat up migrants, it becomes global news. Uh, when something happens in uh, Cologne, it becomes global news. Uh, when something happens in India, it becomes global news. But I, I must agree with what you are saying. You know, uh, typically every room, every household in India has a small place, which is the prayer place. Uh, at least used to have in the in the olden days, right? In earlier days, and it's very common to have symbols from other religions there. It's very common. It's very very common. So you know, there'll be a Sikh thing. There'll be a you know a Muslim cross, a Muslim uh, uh, you know uh, piece of the Quran. Uh, writing or, or, or a Christian cross, it's not uncommon at all. I went to a Christian school. Uh, uh, we lived in uh, Iraq in a Muslim area. I, I think it's, it's really quite uh, uh, common. It is, of course, the uncommon uh, fringe elements that, that draw the attention. But uh, you are totally right. I think we just have a history of being a melting pot. In many ways, we are like Europe. Uh, uh, in the sense, we are different countries, essentially. Uh, but it's much more variegated. There's so much, there's so many different things. I don't speak the language. I'm sure if all the Indians in the room were to state their languages they speak, I probably the coverage would be 20% or 10% and, and, and so on. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, history that leads to a sort of uh, tolerance for, for different uh, opinions and an understanding of complexity uh, or, or comfort with complexity. I think we are very, very... You need to be comfortable with complexity, even if you want to cross the road in India. So, <laughs> um, I hope um, I can ask a question as well. Uh, neither of you really are, uh, are certainly not Asa Bloy, which is a giant in uh, acquiring other companies, and Nagaro today is also far from being a startup company. But as companies which have gone much beyond that level, what do you see as the role of the startup culture in? the whole innovation field, and from your perspective, uh, do you see that as something you would like to encourage? I ask this question because in India now, one of the new programs in which a lot of investment and planning is going is Startup India, and trying to encourage exactly what you were saying, the startup culture, so that you know when, when people of my generation, as you said, when you ask them what you want to be, it was always a secure job. Whereas today, as you say, it is wanting to create jobs and wanting to have a, um, have, a, have your own company. But so how do you see the startup culture as contributing to you as two companies which have gone beyond that? And do, how do you see that as a area where India and Sweden could collaborate? <coughs> yeah, of, of course. And uh, that's an area where we can collaborate. I think that for us, uh, uh, startups are very important. We have um, a significant part of the organization that I'm part of uh, are, are doing pre-product innovation. And we need to do that with a lot of good innovators that might be part of startups. So that's, that's part of our, actually our, our daily work to identify those and, and work together with them. And as we are developing this organization, I think that that is something that we would like to see going on also in in our Indian office? I, I think that, uh, so there are, there are two or three parts of it. So one is the, the importance of the startup culture, the government uh, intervention or support of the startup culture, and then how can Nagaro and, and Asaheb Loy benefit from it, and, and how can India, Sweden sort of uh, drive it uh, uh, together. So I, I think the startup culture is very important. I think what distinguishes California is not that the water is different or the uh, air is different or you get better electricity or anything. It's just the way the mindset of the people there. And uh, uh, it leads the world in, in thinking about technology, sometimes along uh, paths that appear to be uh, foolish and uh, silly, but sometimes along paths that will change the world, right? So uh, uh, I think the startup culture is very important. I always feel that the, uh, the government is the exact opposite of startups uh, in many ways. And there's not much the government can do to support startups. But when the prime minister stands up and says startups are really important, I mean, I think more than the 
little money that they put aside for startup programs, I think it is a huge endorsement and uh, it, it gives a certain uh, confidence to people. And uh, I think in that sense, it has been very, very useful. The, it's, more, it's more symbolic, uh, but even that is uh, very, very uh, uh, necessary. Uh, we are very much uh, interested in startups as Nagaro. I'm also part of the startup warehouse uh, in Gurgaon. Uh, on the steering board, etc. Uh, I think uh, we have found it difficult to uh, uh, partner with startups uh, for uh, tangible uh, outcomes, but we have a policy where we are even hosting a few on our premises and we are even uh, uh, doing some free work for them from time to time as a way just of infusing the way we think. Uh, you know, our, our client base includes maybe about uh, 20, 30 companies that might be classified as startups all over the world. And I think more than the money we make from them or the actual physical outcomes that we have from them, it's the mindset. And I think we learn a lot from startups in that sense. Uh, uh, hopefully one day we will be able to actually uh, you know, do more uh, 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 with startups. I think the only challenge though is that uh, uh, startups are very focused, and they know what they where they want to go to. And as a large company, you're you're you know it's very difficult to engage. But if you do find a startup in locking, for example, you would definitely be you know uh, introducing them to Asab Loy, for example. And India and Sweden, I think you know a lot of money around the world is finding its way into investments in Indian startups. I really think that it's uh, uh, it is a very very inexpensive way of innovating. Uh, uh, that that class of engineer is rising, uh, is, is graduating today, which is different from, again, from, from my generation, when we were not, uh, we were very afraid to experiment, and we, and sensors were expensive, and we couldn't have any great equipment in the labs and all that, and today, sensors are cheaper, stuff is cheaper, labs have, are better funded, uh, there's a lot more confidence in, in engineering and innovation, and I think that uh, uh, we should be looking at ways in which we can bring the Startup ecosystems, the venture capital ecosystems, and uh, 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 you know, and some collaboration around that. But it's a very good question. I, I don't have the uh, short answer, but it's a very good question. In fact, uh, um, you know, Swedish companies, uh, one Swedish startup, well, it's no longer startup really, it's, uh, which has actually got financing from India. Uh, I'm talking about Truecaller, and uh, they got their financing from Sequoia India, and further financing also, they are actually successfully getting in India. Uh, I think India, um, though the you know the government funding you're saying is not that you know, not, not that much because, but I don't know how much how much funding is enough for the startups because the sky is the limit. But on the whole, actually, funding from India is actually easier uh, at times than in Sweden. I'm sure some of the Swedish companies here would agree to that. Yeah, I mean. So I am also, uh, you know, I have lots of friends in the venture capital in industry in India, and today they are saying that uh, they are the ones who are begging for deals, because the good deals, there are so many people chasing the good deals. So money is actually flown in to India uh, or rushed into India for the U.S. and and Japan, etc. And a lot of it is, like SoftBank has invested several billion dollars last year in Indian startups uh, uh, out of Japan, and they've just invested a billion in one company, a billion in another company, and. So, you know, this is, uh, it's a country being built. Yeah? So this is a gold rush of sorts. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of opportunity and also the money can be used uh, for other uh, ventures here. Good morning. My name is Hormas Kapadia. Uh, born in India, but long-term resident in Sweden since the last 45 years, in fact. Uh, I worked in the 90s for Ericsson, uh, establishing the mobile communication systems. Um, Manmohan Singh was still finance minister, and we were coming along at that time. But I found, working with the Swedes in India, there was a lot of miscommunication. Although Swedes speak excellent English, India, English is our second language, our first language. And I still find that there is a lot of miscommunication. Can you give us, from Asai Bloy and from your side, some hints on how... Uh, to improve communications between technicians in India and technicians in Sweden. Because very recently, I had an example of a company bought by Birla in Sweden, who had a lot of problems communicating between themselves, even though they all spoke English. Please, give us some advice on that. Th 
Thank you very much for a very good question. That will also be our last one. Um, so if you want to add also a final reflection, please do so. Yeah, I think that's a very good question and, and the, one of our daily challenges, actually. And I think I don't have a really good answer more than, than we, we try to use the, the common knowledge as face, face, face time is, is one good enabler to, to, uh, to, uh, for good communication and avoiding misunderstanding. And then, then the, to use the knowledge of the different levels to try to minimize communicating through emails and, and, and such, such channels. And actually, we are, we are building a lot of uh, video conference setups and such things to try to, to, to uh, convey also the, the other parts, not just the words. And I think that's, that's the key that we are trying to, to use for now, at least. And the uh, reflection. Well, Yes, it's very, very interesting uh, to be here and hear the different uh, questions. And uh, uh, I really must say that this, uh, this, um, your point on the multicultural, uh, multicultural, multicultural culture part of that is really, I agree, that is really something that you just need to come to India once, and you, you see that that immediately. That, that's very interesting and very much something for us to learn from. I would say. Uh, you know, Nagaro now is a international group, and we have subsidiaries and, and hundreds of people in Germany, in the U.S., in Austria, in Sweden, in Norway, in Denmark, in uh, U.K., and, and so on. And uh, the world is uh, speaks with different uh, contexts. Uh, I, if I speak to my brother, it's with a different context, and I sometimes can't understand him. And with my spouse, of course, yeah. Uh, and you know, so uh, it's not just between India and Sweden. I think if a German speaks to an Austrian, it's it's a different context. If a German from Bavaria speaks to the Hamburg resident, it's a different context. In Asa Abloy, which is a customer, we also work with Asa Abloy in EMEA and Asa Abloy in the U US and Asa Abloy in, in Stockholm. And they all speak different languages. Yeah? Uh, they all speak differently. So the US relationship is very different from this relationship, for example. And even internally, they, they all uh, speak different languages. So I think it is a challenge of our, of our times. I think it's definitely a challenge, but it's also the, uh, the you know, it also brings uh, richness, the diversity brings richness. And, uh, uh, you know, I tend to look at the glass half full rather than half empty. And I think that there is, uh, you know, we also work with Ericsson, by the way, uh, uh, from time to time at least. Uh, uh, I, I like to I like to see this as a uh, uh, you know uh, the U.S. has a certain style or actually again as I say U.S. I start to think in a middle or coastal and New York versus California and all of that but but they did overall everybody brings a certain point of view to the table and certain value to the table a certain energy or philosophy or thinking or capability and in the end I think we are better if we are able to uh, utilize it all so I, I you know I I, I am uh, uh, grateful for an event like this, which gives us a chance to get to know each other. And uh, you know, thanks very much for uh, having us here. And I hope it was useful or at least provoked some thoughts. And uh, uh, very happy to uh, stay in touch. And thank you again for to Sweden in general for our great relationship uh, with you. Thanks. A very big thank you to you in the audience to your questions. And I believe what you just mentioned in the end, Dr. Florio this getting to know each other and meeting each other is also what we will have a bit more opportunity right after here. So please stay, there will be more coffee, I suppose, and use this opportunity to, to build these person-to-person -person relationships that will build all our countries in the end. I, I just wanted to make a comment on uh, your challenge which you presented about team building and cross-cultural. And uh, One aspect I think you all probably have considered already, there are a lot of Indian students that come to Sweden have been trained here in terms of culture and learn the ways of working. So they could potentially be really good team members that can help bridge uh, those concerns. Just a comment. And, and based on that same comment, uh, one of the things that we are planning this year is actually an innovation hackathon which will bring together Swedish students and Indian students to solve some of the problems that you actually presented, whether it's clean air or it's connected with smart cities. Um, so this is a program that uh, we are planning this year, which will also talk about 
how do you reabsorb these Indian students back to either Swedish companies here or Indian companies here? So it's also about presenting the skill sets and also showcasing Swedish students who have an interest in India. So I think it's, this is our dream that, you know, it's called co-creating the future to see Sweden and India sort of work together. So that will be uh, one of our highlights for India Unlimited uh, in May. The innovation hackathon will actually happen in April, a few days before, and the results will be presented during the 2nd and 3rd of May uh, in Stockholm. Among the other subjects that we will cover will be uh, smart cities, it'll be Skill Up India, it'll be about uh, innovation. So we have a lot of interesting topics. Gender and diversity is one of our hottest topics. Uh, it's super interesting to look at diversity in India and look at gender in Sweden and exchange best practices. So the, this is actually an innovation platform in itself um, where we will have a lot of good exchanges. But prior to the business seminars, we'll kick it off with um, a film festival that will show also the diversity of India through its uh, films. And we are not trying to just show a sort of Bollywood, but we're trying to show uh, films that are coming from different regions of India. So if you have the opportunity, 21st to the 24th of April, learn about India through its film. That's a fantastic way to understand a culture. And we have great celebrities coming from India um, for that. And, and what we will end with is, of course, Namaste Stockholm in Kungsre Gordon which will be a big India celebration. So come with your family and friends and uh, experience India in the heart of Stockholm in Kungsre Gordon. Thank you so much.